speakers of the House of Representatives. Yusef Savellano served as the Vice Mayor of Cabugao from 1981 to 1987. He was the province's governor in 1992, as well as from 2001 to 2004, and again from 2007 to 2010. He also served the province as its vice governor from 1988 to 1992, and again from 2010 to 2016. He was honored with the Distinguished Alumni Award for Good Governance in 2011 by the University of the Philippines Alumni Association for his achievements and contributions in serving the university and the community. He was also recognized with the Icon of Youth Award, the Outstanding Young Legislator Award presented by the National Movement of Young Legislators. He also received a plaque of recognition for his visionary, trailblazing, and dynamic leadership in the implementation of the CABSAC Outreach Program. Let's all welcome Under Secretary Dirgashas and Victor D.V. Sabaliano. We are looking to increase local food production in livestock by five times by 2028. So, yan ang hamon namin sa When the invitation of Stat Base came and I read the title Enhancing the Protein Meat Sector for secu Food Security, I had to be here to share with you what we are doing at the Department of Agriculture. The first thing we did in the livestock group was to synchronize all the uh, efforts in livestock. The missions of the five livestock agencies were aligned and directed towards a common goal. There were duplications in their programs and activities, which we rationalized. We eliminated projects that did not work or did, or did not work well. 
and reallocated sources to those that do. There were combinations, combinations of activities and actions that streamlined what was confusing to the industry. This housekeeping base was basic but very vital. The second action that we did was to ensure biosecurity at the Department of Agriculture for Livestock. The poultry sector was beset by avian influenza or AI. AI is slowly spreading through uh, migratory birds and we are trying to contain spread. The egg industry and the broiler industry are a resilient group. They require very little intervention, but they depend so much on sound and time, timely government policies. They are waiting for AI active, uh, vaccines to be tested, cleared and approved for local use. All vaccines have been around for a long time, but there is no approved protocol for its testing, approval and use. After much consultation and discussion, we will submit to the President the regulatory documents to the President for his signature. There are five AI applicants and we are looking to this to mitigate the AI spread in the Philippines. The hub industry was beset by African swine fever or ASF. The hub industry has been disseminated by the disease. We are now on our way to recovery, but it's still looking too long, too slow. We are now battling ASF like an insurgency war, farm by farm, sicho by sicho, barangay by barangay, municipality by municipality, and province by province. Again, the fastest solution is a vaccine. There are four applicants for ASF vaccine, and they are in various stages of trial at our veterinary laboratory division at the Bureau of Animal Industry. For both the AI and ASF vaccines, we want to do it fast, but we want to do it safe also. This is the balancing act, but we are streamlining the process to expedite trials, approvals, and their eventual use. As the due diligence in the science takes its course, we are also resolving regulatory matters for veterinary feeds, drugs, and biologicals, which includes the vaccine. The Department of Agriculture has the laboratories to perform tests. We have the greatest concentration of skilled veterinarians to do this test, and we have the backing of the, of the international organizations like the FAO and the World Organization of Animal Health. We have also the experience since the creation of BAI in 1923. However, when the Republic Act 9711 and 10611, which are the creation of FDA and the, and the Food Safety Act, confusion started to emerge as to the proper regulatory body to manage veterinary drugs, supplies, products, biologicals. This was properly delineated in 1991 with EMOA, where, where the people matter belongs to the BFAD. Now FDA and those animal, animals belong to BAA. But recently, after these two Republic Acts, BAA, BAI, BAI or BAI, performs all the trials and testing, but the approval is by FDA. The last joint instrument between BAI and the FDA expired in 2018. It was revived for six months in 2020, but was never resolved. We asked the, we asked the, sec the executive secretary of the president, the Honorable Lucas Bersamini, for a meeting last September 22, 2023, at 4 o'clock. He gave us 10 minutes on September 25. He called for a meeting at the same day, but scheduling was difficult. It was reset in the next day on September 26. The uh, DOH, FDA, the DA, BAE were asked to submit their position papers after a week. We asked for an extension for a week because so, so many words work. We both submitted the paper last 
October 9, 2023. It is now at the hands of the President and we trust his wisdom and benevolence on this matter. Hopefully, we get to resolve this 13-year-old problem in the month. The government wants to have coherent policies and de definite answers to the stakeholders in agriculture. By having this, we hope to make more, we have to make them invest more. The regulatory matters have to be aligned to get the private sector to produce more food and ensure food security for the nation. There are also other non-science interventions we have done recently. The hog racers in Cebu were having difficulty in moving the products throughout, throughout the Visayas and even in Luzon and Mindanao. But right now, we have, uh, they have over 180,000 pallets of meat in cold storage warehouses. The farm gate prices of pork are lower than cost of production. Only in Cebu, you can now enjoy the famous Cebu lechon. When I look back at history, the biggest problem was understanding and miscommunication. It was Bai enforcing its rules, rules and regulations, and it was the province of Cebu protecting its farmer. At the end of the day, those two objectives were one and the same. I visited the governor of Cebu, Governor Glenn Garcia, and we were able to discuss ways to go forward. We are now in the process of unlocking the opportunities of Cebu, but uh, there, were, there was a meeting of minds to resolve the problem, the problem, hopefully within this month. The only blessing I have as an Undersecretary of the Department of Agriculture handling livestock and others is that the problems that we set are, are all sol uh, solvable. It just, it, it just uh, take, takes time personal attention, and a good team to resolve issues and concerns. There is very little intervention required from the government. The market may need a small adjustment, but in, if the playing field is fair and the regulations are transparent, the livestock industry in the Philippines will survive. The production of food will increase by five times by 2028. We call it five times 28 equals food security. To make it beneficial to the livestock producers and the Filipino public, we are focusing on VAM, BAM, Volume, Affordability, and Margins. Volume, at the end of the President's term in 2028, we want to increase the volume of our production by five times. Affordability, we want to make food prices affordable for fellow Filipinos. With enough volume, we hope to make food affordable. Margin. Finally, we want producers, especially small-scale farmers, to make money. We want to ensure all stakeholders to have a good margins to make business sustainable. Lastly, before I end, I usually give my personal number to everyone. That's what I've been doing in my uh, district and in my province when I was a, a public servant. Bakit? Because pinaupo nyo kami, pinapwede nyo kami dito para tumulong. So, ang gagawin ko, I'll give my personal number para any time of the day you can text me. But don't call me. Just text. Text your name, your barangay, uh, what do you need, what do you suggest, what solutions you can uh, contribute to us. So, I'm going to give you my number to. Personal po po to. Hindi personal. Hindi si secretary po to. Kasi yung secretary po, baka ibang masagot eh. So yung akin na lang. My personal number is 0917-539-8321. Nakuha niyo po yan. So again, 0917-539-8321. May mga conditions lang po tayo. Siguraduhin niyo lang po kung mga dumtetext kayo. So sometimes, may mga misset sa akin. Minsan, Karen, may nagsabi, I love you, I miss you. Eh, that, nabuta ko nun. So, sigurado rin nyo na mag, if when you text, yung talaga ito text nyo. Sa akin, yung text nyo, ano yung pwede natin gawin, pwede yung tulong, ano yung mga solusyon na pwede natin gawin para matulungan po natin ang ating bagsang Pilipinas. Again, maraming salamat po at uh, thank you to the organizers.
Agama na sa Musag Sabayano or Ilocano Connection. Thank you. And uh, having the other secretary's number, just make sure not to send him any spam, please. <laughs> Our next speaker is Engineer Arnel de Mesa, Assistant Secretary for Operations of the Department of Agriculture. Engineer de Mesa is a distinguished leader in the agri-fishery sector. He is renowned for his contributions to agricultural technology and rural development strategies. He graduated from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños in 1996 as one of the top agricultural engineers in the Lion Censure exam. He served as the de Deputy Program Director of the DA World Bank Assisted Mindanao Rural Development Program in 2006. His dedication to public service led him to become a career executive service officer and Department of Agriculture Regional Technical Director for Davao Region. Let's please all give Engineer Arnel de Mesa a warm round of applause. Thank you, Attorney Karen. Maganda uh, umaga po sa lahat. Good morning, of course, to Yusek Sabiliano, uh, Professor Manit. Uh, kita ko kanina si dati namin uh, Yusek sa DA, Yusek Adriano. And uh, medyo kinakabahan ako kasi some of you here are my former colleagues sa uh, department, uh, sa DA, or uh, in one way or another, we had meetings uh, before. So again, thank you for the invitation today. So I'll be talking about uh, revving up challenges in producing food. So let me start by stating the obvious. Uh, poverty incidence is one of the uh, patulay, continuing problems of our economy, especially on the agricultural economy. And it is uh, continuously becoming uh, a rural phenomenon. Karamihan pa rin po ng mga uh, mahirap ay nasa mga rural areas and this is also very prevalent among our uh, stakeholders in the sector, mostly our farmers, our fishers and uh, actually number one dito yung mga mangi is the second will be the coconut farmers and then our rice farmers. In 2021, we registered about 18% of the total poor, I, ano po, 19.9 million. And uh, if you look at the figure, almost a third ay nasa sector po ng agrikultura. Another problem associated with poverty is malnutrition. If you look at these numbers, again, this is, these are obvious numbers as well. Uh, ang isang malaking problema natin will be distanting. If you look at this, about uh, for infants and young children, more than 20%. And then, as you go along, uh, preschoolers, adolescents, 22.3%. Simply because of the lack and access to healthy and nutritious foods. Pag nagkaroon ng kalamidad, Usually, uh, foods that are being distributed are instant noodles and canned goods. The other day, uh, together with Farmer Fresh, we launched with instant pinakbet and instant chapsuy. It will solve two problems. Yung, uh, other areas who are producing more of the vegetables and may produce ng murang presyo and uh, to solve yung uh, problema po na uh, mabigyan ng healthy and nutritious food. We are also coordinating with our egg farmers in Batangas, uh, producing yung tinatawag na roasted egg that can last up to four to six months in self-life. Uh, based on studies, uh, patuloy po na bumababa ang protein intake ng mga Filipinos. Very few Filipinos, lalo na yung mahirap, are eating eggs, pork, chicken, and beef. That's why uh, we're introducing a lot of uh, protein, hopefully, in the diet of the Filipino. So, next slide will show that 
even though the cases of malnutrition, ano, before that, nagiba yung slides ko. Wala yung slide dong malnutrition. But nevertheless, before this, bumababa yung, yung level ng malnutrition. But beginning 2019, which is the start ng pandemic, ay tumataas na po ulit yung number and prevalence of undernourished people at about 5.9 or 6 million Filipinos are undernourished in the year 2022. So, magkaugnay po yung problema ng sektor sa kahirapan at sa malnourishment ng mga Pilipino. And then if you go in this slide, you will see na uh, maraming uh, commodities naman po tayo that we are 100% uh, sufficient. But let let us not be, ano po, uh, wag tayong mag, uh, maratel dito sa numbers na to because some of our food sufficiency are focused in rural areas or where they are being produced. In key metro areas, napakamahal po ng pagkain simply because of the problem of distribution and the problem of logistics. Meron nga po nagsasabi, it's more expensive to bring uh, seafoods from Mindanao to Japan than bringing it to Metro Manila because of the problems of logistics. We are doing something about the problems of, for example, corns. It's being produced largely in Region 10 and in Region 12 and in uh, Northern Luzon, specifically in Isabela. But the problem is that uh, there are lots of spoilings because of lack of post-harvest facilities. We're trying to build uh, under the Philippine Rural Development Project a big grain silo in Batangas and there's also a proposal in Bukidnon. But this should not be pragmatic in approach. We should do it in a more programmatic uh, uh, response. Next slide will show us some of the lingering uh, and emerging sector challenges. Nangunguna po rito yung, yung sa budget. Uh, we're so focused on rice because rice, uh, aminin po natin o hindi, is a very political commodity. And it's very difficult for the Philippines not to have adequate uh, rice at the very affordable uh, prices. And because of this, there's limited budget when it comes to high value commercial crops. Si USEC DV, yung budget niya for livestock, bagamat tumaas, but if you compare it with rice, talaga pong uh, napakalaki. There's a huge disparity on, on prices. And uh, next problem, of course, is the limited uh, area per farmer ng kanilang sinasaka. On average, is about 1 to 2 hectares. Everything is expensive if your land is very small. Your inputs is expensive because you cannot buy in bulk. Your labor is expensive. And your efficiency in doing research, in doing innovations, in uh, mechanizing your farms, it's very difficult. So that's why we are proposing and started during uh, uh, USEC uh, Adriano to really focus on uh, clustering and consolidation of farms. And we are being uh, visited by typhoons on average 18, 18 to 20 a year and four or five of that will be very destructive, specifically in northern and central Philippines. Of course, in, in ASEAN, we have the lowest uh, mechanization level. The uh, horsepower rating per unit hectare is still a little over two horsepower per hectare. Compare it with uh, Korea, Japan, and, and China, of course. We're very, uh, we're very weak on that. In terms of irrigation, we have four million hectares of irrigable land area and only about two million is irrigated. And at the rate we are irrigating of 40 to 50,000 hectares per year, it will take us several decades to fully irrigate our lands. We are proposing small-scale irrigation projects as one of the, uh, the most notable solutions. The gestation period is uh, very short and is highly controllable by groups of farmers. And a lot of things, uh, because I have very limited time. 
Now, I go now on uh, what are our proposals. I have with me some uh, few uh, structural and transformational uh, proposals within uh, the sector. So, agriculture shouldn't be only producing more, but we need uh, to produce, to feed the nation, to make the Filipinos healthy. Kung mapapansin niyo po ngayon yung mga Koreans, noong unang panahon, siguro ang average height nila is 5'2", a little over 5 feet. But now, especially those in the K-pop industry, ang tatangka nila because they're eating a lot of protein. And Filipinos should start also doing that. And we need to increase the income of farmers at least double right now to move them away from extreme poverty. And we can do that actually. So we need to focus on productivity and market. The, produ the production of our farmers shouldn't stop by simply producing. They should have quick and easy access to markets. And by giving them access, we need to solve the problems of logistics and distribution all over the country. Ours is an, uh, is an island nation. We have more than 7,000 islands. And uh, karamihan ng production po natin nasa mga liblib na lugar. Yung pag-aaral po namin sa farm to market uh, roads, we need more than 180,000 kilometers. And at the rate, again, we're doing FMRs. Uh, decades pa rin po bago matapos yan. That's why the president is uh, focusing now on, we have already developed the FMR network plan. And hopefully, uh, there will be more budget. But hindi na kagaya ng una na napakasimple ng FMR, but we want to focus really on, on uh, bringing or bridging the gap between the production to the market. We also need to climate-proof agriculture. In rice alone, about 500 to 600,000 metric tons is wasted every year. Rice pa lang yun. Corn, isa pa rin po yan. High-value, livestock, everything. A lot of uh, metric tons of uh, agriculture produce go to waste simply because we are not uh, climate-proof. We also need to focus on energy and fertilizer. Last, uh, two weeks ago, I was in Batangas. Uh, we piloted po yung solar irrigation project uh, under Chinese investment. I interviewed the farmer. He invested 70,000 for diesel for his three, three to five hectare farm. 70,000 just for diesel alone in one season. So, and another one, I, I talked to Emil po. Uh, they have lots of waste sa kanilang chicken manure. Pinamimigay lang po nila yun. And there are lots of potential to convert this waste into energy and fertilizer. And more importantly, is to cluster. By clustering, by consolidating, a lot of things will become cheaper. Your inputs, your fertilizer, your labor, your get high efficiency. Marami po kaming na-survey, namimigay ng uh, halimaw, yung uh, combined harvester. Gagamitin niya lang yun kalahating araw. Matetenga ngayon how many months? Simply because maliit lang yung area niya. But if we cluster them, we'll have more efficient uh, mechanization. So, leading to this, we are suggesting four key uh, transformation in the agriculture. One is to establish agriculture economic corridors. The spoken hub, we need to bring all agriculture productions produce the spokes, and uh, make sure that the processing, napakamahal po ng uh, bigas, uh, simply because uh, mahal din yung ating uh, post-harvest uh, and processing facilities aside from, as mentioned, the inputs and the labor. Second is yung, uh, as I mentioned so many times earlier, is the need to class, cluster and consolidate farms. Next is to produce private-driven researches. Netherlands and Singapore are one of the two countries very notable in this regard. Yung research ng no kanilang agriculture sector 
is mainly driven by the need, by the problems caused by the, or, or yung nararamdaman ng private sector. I remember one time when I was in Singapore, yung, yung crabs nila, di ba, they're, they're very, they're, they like their crabs so much. At ang gusto ng mga Singaporeans, when they cut half yung crab nila, talagang malamahan at punong-puno ng, uh, ano tawag doon? Al Aligi. They did a good research about that. And right now, that's what they're getting. And then, next is on the uh, reform yung plans natin. This is not only true for agriculture, it's true for the entire uh, Philippine economy. Every year, we do plans for one year. And sometimes, yung plano ng taon na ito, makakalimutan na yon the following year. Plus, of course, we have election every three years. And we forget everything. Pag may bago kaming secretary, we have a new plans, we have a new strategy, and everything is new. So it's quite difficult for us. And uh, sometimes, uh, we are hoping that our plans and budgets and our the way we do planning is what happened last year sometimes we just do a little tweaking you know we need to do uh, more of you know uh, it's very difficult for me to say this because i'm still with the department and, and the department's spokesperson and uh, there are a lot of things really that needs to be done just quick run through of all of this Again, on number one, we need to bring in uh, what's the comparative advantage in this particular province, in this particular region. And we need to bring the resources there, the infrastructure, the processing facility. I had experience before, the time namin ni Yusek Fermin, uh, na nagkaroon ng problema ng ESF. We had a program to bring in the port from General Santos from Visayas to Metro Manila. Nagkaroon din ng EO uh, para i-control ang presyo ng, ng bubble. But the problem is we are bringing live pigs to Metro Manila because the slaughterhouses are here. So we are also bringing ASF along the way. Nagalit pa nga si Mayor Congressman na ngayon. Basta ko din si Tacloban. Uh, yung artista dati. Uh, Ah, Richard Gomez, si Congressman Richard Gomez. Pag inalaw daw yung pag pagdaan ng mga baboy doon, yung pag-ihe, pag uh, that will cause uh, ASF. So, we need to bring yung pork in a box sana pagdating dito because of the lack of this uh, infrastructure uh, processing uh, facilities in the areas where they are being produced. That's, that's another problem. Next, again, is we really need to to cluster and consolidate. This is very, very important in the sector. Nung galing po ako ng Bangkok, diya, nung uh, kasapagpunta ng India, grabe yung difference nung farms nila versus sa farm natin. Bukod sa talagang, ano sila, napaka-organized and then very rectangular, very consistent. Sa atin, ang gulo-gulo. So we really need to do a lot of transformation and we're starting on this after. And we're partnering with the private institutions like Jollibee Group Foundation and so many others uh, to make this a reality. Next, as I mentioned kanina po, is on the reserves. We need to bring in the government, the private uh, groups, and the academy. They have the expertise. Kailangan ibalik natin yung balik scientista program. They have the capacity to bring in uh, reforms sa atin. And a lot of researches ay nagiging cabinet lang po. They are in the cabinets. And uh, when I was the regional director of Calabarzon, some of my colleagues in the research, they are so fond of very small and uh, repetitive rice, uh, soybean after rice, mungo after rice. I go, no, let's stop that. Let's focus on what can, uh, what can uh, deliver, uh, what can produce, you know, big results. We should produce big results for agriculture. Let us stop wasting for those very small research. 
small colleges and universities can do those small researches. And then lastly, again, we need to bring in some reforms on how we do our plans and budgeting. We are, we are suggesting minimum three years to create that energy, to create that transformational uh, changes within the government, especially in the agri-sector. Para po may, pag may pinalama kami ngayon, sure kami na within the next three years, we will be implementing that plan. And it will not be changed. Thank you very much. At maganda mag Thank you, Engineer Ed DeMesa, for your technical insight. And now, after hearing from the government and regulatory side, we'll go to civil society. Our next speaker is Dr. Fermin Adriano of the Foundation for Economic Freedom. Dr. Adriano is a distinguished academician, writer, and policy advisor. He held prominent roles, such as being the information director of the UP system and the Vice Chancellor of UP Los Baños and board member of the Manila Chronicle. His extensive contributions extend to journalism with a weekly column in the Manila Times and scholarship, encompassing books and articles on various topics including Mindanao development, agrarian reform, and rural development. He played pivotal advisory roles for key government officials in areas like agriculture and Mindanao. Additionally, he is actively involved in advisory councils and organizations, including the Asian Development Bank Institute and the Madre de Amor Hospice Foundation. Let us all welcome Dr. Fermin Adriano. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, topic of the forum today is uh, cultivating investments in Philippine agro-industrial manufacturing food sector. It's a stylized fact in economics that growth is a function of investments. And in terms of investments, there are two main sources. One is from, one is from the government side, government makes an investment, and then the other one is the private sector investment. I suspect or I think that this investment uh, that is written here pertains to investment coming from the private sector. So I will focus on that. And uh, instead, my topic is uh, ensuring a business conducive agriculture sector to boost economic growth. Instead of coming out with, uh, with uh, the uh, identifying the factors or the environment by which the private sector will participate in agriculture and food, I would approach it in a reverse fashion. In other words, my presentation is what hinders greater private sector participation in our agri-food industry? The first you have to question, is there really limited private sector participation in agri-food uh, industry? Uh, instead of coming out with anecdotal or polemical or rhetorical uh, and respond to that, I would Next slide, please. I would show you a slide showing that there's really limited private sector investment in Philippine agriculture. So if you look at the number of establishments, these are former establishments, there's only 1% uh, of establishment engaged in agri-food in the country, only 1%. So that's because uh, of the small percentage, uh, this, this results in uh, consistently low farm productivity because there is no commercialization of the agricultural sector. In other words, it has become a peasant-based agriculture. And if you are uh, uh, familiar with the literature on peasantry, particularly you read Anton Chayanel of the Fury of Peasantry, it cannot be the trigger for economic development because they don't produce much surplus. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, enterprises in agriculture, you'll find, again, it's indicative of the limited private sector participation. 
most of them are micro establishments. So you have limited uh, commercial establishment, and in those limited commercial establishment, they are mostly micro, maliit, masyadong maliit. Uh, basically, there, there is a dearth of investment uh, in in uh, in the agriculture sector by the large medium scale and even small scale enterprises. And why? Why is the uh, private sector so hesitant uh, in investing in the agri-food industry? Uh, we're lucky that uh, during a uh, that there is a study on that. Uh, during our time, we commissioned the late Dr. Ramon Yedra. He was the former head of the DA's agricultural uh, uh, agribusiness uh, AMAS, Agribusiness and Marketing uh, Assistance Service. He was the head of that. And we were, we told, we, it, he was instructed, come out with a study, a systematic study, why private sector uh, is not investing so much in the agriculture sector. And he came out with a study called um, Private Sector Investment in Agri-Food Sector Constraints and Challenges. It was published in 2021. Next slide, please. So, what was involved in the study? Uh, he came out with 10 focus group discussions and surveyed 53 companies which were involved in the production of banana, cacao, coconut, coffee, cashew, cassava, dragon fruit, purple yam, etc., etc. They were also involved in financial services and logistics uh, services. And the companies were, came from, uh, uh, involved were small, medium, and large scale. So that's the practically the universe of the respondent that he uh, surveyed during the time. And what was his uh, main uh, uh, findings? There were actually two. He divided into two. And he, uh, the first one is that uh, he looked at the investment climate in general. So he asked questions about that. And then they asked the second tier of his questioning was the ease of doing business. And in the ease of doing business, there were two uh, concerns that uh, merited the study. One is ease in starting the business operation, and the second is when you're already there, business operation concern. So in terms of investment climate, what were the main bottlenecks as far as the private sector is concerned? One is said, the number one identified reason is difficulty in getting scale. They cannot access land because the ownership ceiling is only five hectares. You cannot engage in commercial farms with only five hectares or one hectare each to be able to produce a commercial farm and introduce a lot of your technologies, uh, including uh, mechanization. That was also mentioned by Asik uh, Arnel. The second is the perceived uh, 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 instability in the agricultural sector because of the climate change and of course more recently the entry of pest, uh, animal pests and plant diseases. The third factor that they identified is the perceived inadequate government support introducing or mitigating the space, particularly in the spread of animal plant and pest diseases. And of course we are not yet climate resilient in terms of our technologies in the country because it's not being given, although there's some, so much work said, said to it, but if you look at the budget, there's little really on climate change uh, resiliency. The, the, the number four factor that they mentioned is that it's the outdated and lack of awareness of the incentives being offered by the government. And the last one are taxes, custom duties, and tariffs for those who are uh, needing imported materials as raw materials, they complain about the high tariff rates of certain commodities. Like for example, if you're involved in animal feed milling, the tariff rate is about 35% lowest and it can go high as 40 or above. Uh, compared to Vietnam, which is only 2%. So, so the second topic, on, next, next, next slide please. So the ease of doing business, uh, as I said, it should be ease of starting business there were two main concerns or bottlenecks or impediments that the private sector uh, identified. The first one is obtaining licenses and permits. It's extremely difficult, they said, to obtain licenses uh, and permits at different levels of the government, particularly at the, at the LGU level. 
The second one is accessing capital. Not accessing, accessing, sorry, let's say uh, type of error. No, it's difficult for them to access capital for their venture because it's uh, extremely, they said, it's a big, most of the uh, companies think that it's a risky business if you're engaged in agriculture, particularly the production side. On the business operations concern, they measure, like they mentioned, this is the second wing of the ease of doing business, the procurement of raw materials. Again, as I already noted about the corn, and then if you're engaged in the wheat sector or something like that, the high tariff of that, if you're engaged in fishing, the high tariff on fish or something like that. Uh, although there's no tariff on fish, but the limited uh, entry of uh, your, your raw materials. Of course, they mentioned the logistics. It has always been told that uh, it's much easier to transport uh, some of our products from, uh, uh, products from China to the Philippines compared to Mindanao to the Philippines or something like that. And of course, the last one they mentioned is poor infrastructure. So for me, what are the priority agendas if we are going to address the concerns of the private sector? There are a lot of them, but the next slide, this is the last slide. <clears throat> I think I, I'm, I'm also involved in Go Negocio with uh, Mr. Joey Concepcion, and I'm an advisor to that. And we have basically this concept of big brothers. We're assembled at the, the biggest companies in the Philippines. And when we talk to them, the first really concern of the private sector, these are the big ones, you know, uh, uh, they need, they're there. <laughs> the first concern is really about access to land, which is we cannot consolidate land. Somebody is asking for 3,500 hectares so that he can plant corn, so that he can feed his uh, uh, the poultry, you know, poultry. The other one is asking for so, ma so much hectares to, to be able to sustain his dairy industry. But they cannot assemble that kind of land because of the uh, continued implementation of agrarian reform. And the ceiling, the land ceiling is five hectares. Well, you can say that you can do a leasehold, but they're saying that the transaction cost of talking to so many farmers and trying to solve the tenurial problems of the farmers, like some of them uh, have been granted or something like that, but they have passed it on to their kids or even their grandkids. Some of them have pulled it, etc., are just too much to absorb as a cost. The transaction cost is too high. It's quite difficult to consolidate land. And because of that, we cannot uh, apply the necessary farm machineries, neither we can apply the latest technology, including drones or something like that. So that's a foremost concern of the problem. It's really access to land. It's not ownership of land, by the way. They say that we're not interested in owning them. We are only interested in accessing them or leasing them. Because of the fact that if you buy them, the cost is just tremendous. It's more practical than just to lease them. The second one I think that they mentioned is about number three, it should be number three. The ease of doing business, particularly at the LG level. I think there was a recent executive order that was uh, uh, issued by the president, which, which we commend, you know, uh, of uh, removing all those toll fees that are being imposed by the local governments. So, you know, if you know, if you're engaged in business, I'm sure that. <laughs> Well, that Danny is, uh, <laughs> Mr. Dan Pauso is shaking, he's nodding, he said. So many tolls, you know, that, like if you pass the road, you have to give tolls, etc., etc. And it's not only at the level of the municipality, it can go down to as low as the barangay. So in other words, I was joking that, you know, the decentralization in the Philippines, also decentralized corruption. Uh, the, the, the third is rationalizing regulatory measures. I think this, it should be scientifically based. It should not be dependent on the whims of the regulatory officials in the Department of Agriculture. There has to be some science and application. If you are going to impose SPS or sanitary, uh, sanitary and fight to sanitary measures. And then I think four, you know, if you allow the private sector to come in, it's not much of a problem because if you look at banana and pineapple industries where the presence of the private sector is heavy, They've taken care of everything, and, you know, the only thing that they wanted is access to that. So they built the roads, the docks, etc., etc. And the last one, I think, which is very critical, particularly to uh, small and medium enterprises and the export community, is to have uh, training about the uh, 
quality standards of other countries. Because I was, I mean, I was still out music. I was telling the people there that you are very, very strict in terms of the regulations uh, on the entry of the imported products. But that same knowledge is not passed on to our ag agri-exporters. You need to train them so that they will pass the strict standard of Europe, Japan, US, etc., etc. Unfortunately, that's not being done. And of course, lastly, the technologies, new technologies. There are new technologies in the pipeline, and uh, I'm sure you're familiar with that, including drone and everything. That should be the role of the government to assist the private sector. What the big ones can do, it, as I said, uh, 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 to assist the private sector and encourage them to uh, invest in the agricultural sector. Lastly, I would say that without the private sector, heavy private sector investment, our agricultural sector will not develop. Why? Because the resources in the hands of the government is just limited. The bulk of the resources of, that kind of this country is in the hands of the private sector. So if they are not going to actively participate, I don't see any future for the agri-food industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Adriano, for that comprehensive insight. And now we'll hear from the private sector, someone from the agricultural industry. Our next speaker is Mr. Edwin Mapano, President of the Philippine Association of Feed Millers Incorporated, or PAFUNA. Mr. Mapano is currently the Vice President for Marketing and Corporate Affairs at UNACO Incorporated. He is a seasoned marketing specialist with a proven track record in the marketing and advertising industry, processing expertise in areas such as marketing strategy, business process enhancement, market research, brand management, and marketing. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Aquaculture and a Master's in Business Administration with a specialization in Bachelor of Science in Aquaculture from the University of the Philippines. Let's all welcome Mr. Edwin Mapano. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank ADR for the invitation. Uh, a special mention to Professor Mahi. Likewise, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Yusef Sevillano and Asek Nemesa and the other uh, commodity heads, commodity sector like Picafi, Danny Kamusto, and Tony Bong Jong. So allow me to share to you our position with regards to how, uh, the role of the private sector in terms of developing this uh, food security in supporting the, uh, the, the feed meal industry. Next slide. So just like to mention PAFMI, PAFMI is an association, Association of Feed Millers Incorporated. We have 39 members, okay, we have uh, feed mills across the nation. And uh, in terms of feed milling, uh, we, we produce feeds uh, for different species. Probably, uh, we can see on the next slide. Uh, we are, in terms of mission, we are aligned uh, there to support the government for food security. So when we talk of feed milling, we look into the different species, the sector, uh, you've got the chicken or the poultry, you have the, the, the swine, the aqua. Uh, the ruminants and the like, okay? And likewise, what is crucial there is we look into the productivity, we look into the per capita consumption, uh, and also the efficiency of the different farms, okay? Next slide. And with that, what is critical is to ensure, to ensure that there is available raw materials, available raw materials for us uh, in the field milling, okay, to to proceed and to support the other sectors. Next slide. So I'm just showing you the integrated model. This applies to the different species. Where in the the value chain, you've got the field milling, you've got the grains in terms of the supply. Then you've got your breeder farm, and then you've got the BOC broiler. Then you've got your chicken production, processing, and then towards the consumer. Next slide. So, 
just to share to you an example of a feed formulation, okay, across species, you've got swine, broiler, chicken layer, and aqua, of which, in terms of requirement, like you've got corn, is utilized wheat, soybean meal, rice bran, copra meal is there, and then you also have uh, coconut oil as a re uh, requirement, then you have also limestone, fish oil, salt, amino acid, and the like. Okay? So, dito pa lang malalaman natin na there is a vast opportunity for the local sector to support our feed milling in terms of formulation. And these are the inclusions. Okay? Next slide. Now, we look into the per capita, per capita consumption. We say that the per capita consumption for pork is around uh, 15.5. Then you've got also for uh, for chicken around 17 kilos per capita. Then you've got for aqua around 30 kilos per capita. And the rest is support. This is just coming from the OECD in terms of per capita consumption and projection towards 2029. Okay, next slide. So now, after computing the per capita consumption and you extrapolate that towards the uh, population, so we have a requirement there. So we have the requirement of the different, can be the pork, poultry, aquaculture product in terms of pork gas. So ito yung kailangan natin. Pork in terms of quantity for 2023 is 1 million something, then chicken is 1.3. Million eggs is 635 milk fish and the like. Okay, so we just check the supply and demand. Next, now uh, this was presented uh, in ASEAN, of which more or less for Philippines, this is around the, the projection of USEC for our feed milling is around 13 to 14 million metric tons. You've got broiler feeds for 3.3 for layers, Y4, aqua 1.6. Uh, wala pa dito yung pet food industry, wala pa dito yung uh, the, the native chicken and the like, and the ruminants. Okay, next. So now, we already know the demand. Where are we going to get it? So where are we going to get it in terms of energy sources? We have there, there the coin. 6.9, wheat 2.2, cassava 668, barley and the like. So these are just uh, forecasts or estimates where we're gonna get the raw materials for the feed milling. Okay, next slide. Likewise, that uh, what was presented was on the energy level. Now this is on the protein side. So protein side, you've got the soybean meal and soybean meal equivalents, which you can have the soybean, you can also have the copra, okay? Then palm kernel ex uh, meal and the like. So you can protein sources. Next slide. So this was based on the meeting last week with the National Corn Program in terms of the forecast. For the supply of corn is here vis a vis plus the, the feed wheat for importation. So, on the average, our feed wheat uh, more or less is around 2.9. Soybean meal ranges from 3.2 to 3.6 million metric tons. Okay, next slide. So, what is the role of puff pea? The role of PAFMI now is to have a strong alliance or cooperation with the different industries. With the different industries so that our, the, the supply of raw materials will be sufficient to support us. Okay, what are these industries? We have the coin industry, okay, there's opportunity there. Next, coconut industry, because we use a lot of cop oil, copper cake. Okay, next, the rice industry for rice bran. Okay, next, limestone. Feed billing, kailangan namin ng limestone. Hindi natin mabubuo yung egg. Or the bones. Okay, it's, it's a relaxed. Next, sugar for molasses. 
A while ago, I presented to you a sample feed formulation of which nandun yung mag-assess. Okay? Next. Salt. Salt is needed for our industry. Okay? Next. Even tapioca. In short, this alone, when you say opportunity, there is opportunity. But we need to work hand in hand with the association of those different commodities to ensure us that there's available good quality, consistent supply, okay, based on the specs of our requirement so that now we'll be able to address the requirement not only of the feed milling and industry but to support the various sectors, the aqua, the livestock and poultry for us to have food security and food safety in the country. Thank you. Oh, so, uh, just to add mong beans and sorghum for, for the gaming industry. Sabong, okay? There's an opportunity here also. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ed Mapano. To continue with our discussion, allow me to introduce attorney Erwin Yamson, policy consultant at the Foundation for Economic Freedom and a partner at Polito and Yamson Law Office. Attorney Yamson is a legal professional with a Bachelor of Law from San Beda College of Law and a Bachelor of Arts in History from the University of the Philippines. He has been a member of the Philippine Bar since 1997 and has made significant contributions to land administration as the Bureau Director of the Land Management Bureau. He is also Executive Director of the Land Administration and Management Project, or LAMP. Following his government service, he co-founded the Polido and Tiamson Law Offices, where he led the land and natural resources practice. Attorney Tiamson's expertise extends to policy consulting and advisory roles with various government agencies and international organizations such as the World Bank and the Asia Foundation. He has been involved in crafting important guidelines and regulations related to land administration and property rights, including the Residential Free Patent Bill. Attorney Tiamson has also co-authored books on public land titling, showcasing his commitment to advancing land administration practices in the Philippines. Let's give a warm round of applause for Attorney Irving Tiamson. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, thank you also to uh, Professor Manhit for the invitation and to the ADR team. Um, I will be discussing one of the most important input in agriculture, which is land. Um, and uh, one of the central uh, events that happened in the Philippines is the Comprehensive Agrarian Reform Program uh, of the last 30 years. And land ownership in agriculture has been uh, uh, greatly affected by this uh, program. So um, uh, let me uh, slide. Okay. So this is what happened to uh, to agricultural lands in the Philippines. Uh, public ag agricultural lands in the last thirty years has been uh, uh, distributed to the actual occupant by the DNR to uh, free patent and by 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 Dara, no, by. Uh, uh, installing uh, landless farmers to uh, unoccupied public lands. So these lands uh, has no amortization with land bank, but it has some restrictions which I will discuss later. So open public agricultural lands has been effectively disposed to small farmers. The size is up to three hectares if you are from Dar, up to five hectares if you are from the DNR. Uh, to free packet. So that is the size. But the average disposition is one hectare. Private agricultural lands or large private agricultural lands has already been acquired also by the government 
and uh, redistribute to, to farmers. Uh, these lands have, uh, of course, up to three hectares only, but this has uh, loans with the uh, with land bank. Uh, this is uh, subject to the Loan Condonation Act, which was recently passed, uh, removing the loans of the farmers from land bank. So, how how many is this land? This uh, represents around five million units. Uh, five million uh, titles were issued on this one. Next slide. So if you're looking for size, uh, there is uh, uh, the collective cloa that are issued also by the... These collective uh, cloas are large tracts of land, but these are false co-ownerships. Meaning to say, um, there is one single title, but in reality, this is divided to a lot of small farmers. Uh, this is again subject to the present split program of DAL where they are presently subdividing it for individual awards. So this seems to be big, but in reality, this is more problematic because it is designed for individual cultivation and not really for collective uh, agriculture. There is another piece of, uh, uh, this is not exactly under the Comprehensive Agrarian Reform Program, but this was instituted side by side with, with CARP, the Indigenous People's Rights Act, whereby our indige indigenous communities were given um, uh, track of land, but mostly these are upland lands. These are huge track of lands, really. But there are also issues in this. Uh, for agriculture, agricultural purposes, this is upland. And also, there is some uh, uh, issue on the, the kind of title that was uh, given to them. It is a qualified title because it is subject to some private rights or prior rights. But these are huge. Another prominent aspect, which was discussed by uh, no, Dr. Adrian uh, a while ago, uh, this is the, the, the more uh, uh, problematic aspect of land reform is the restrictions that it created on the land market. So uh, disposing or uh, giving land is one thing, but restricts, uh, restricting mobility of resources is, is another thing. So one of the most prominent, again, uh, features of, uh, of uh, land reform here is the restrictions on transfers for 10 years. So if a title is given to you, you cannot transact it for 10 years. And it also goes with a with a loan, with a with a land bank loan, uh, especially on those that were acquired from private private lands. So uh, it effectively uh, hinders uh, mobility of resources. There is also restriction on lease, uh, especially uh, shared tenancy. So you can at least land other than a straight lease. If it is to a kind of a tenancy agreement, it is, uh, it is uh, prohibited under the law. And also, lease cannot be made if you still have utang with land bank and bank you know? Although this uh, leasehold thing is uh, like a, a parang dead letter lotto because studies were conducted. A lot of uh, small farmers have been doing shared tenancy also on, on the ground level. Straight lease are only in corporate farmings mostly. Uh, the fourth one is the land holding limit of five hectares per person. So it is illegal in the Philippines to, uh, to own more than uh, five hectares of agricultural land. This also, most of the time people are surprised to, to know that uh, we do not allow people to own more than five hectares of agricultural land. So if you're going, going to buy a land, uh, an agricultural land, and you have wanted to be registered in the Registry of Deeds, you have to go to the the, the, the dark clearance process whereby your land holding will be investigated. So uh, this is another transaction cost that, that is required too. So uh, consolidation through ownership is not possible in the Philippines. So it uh, mostly affects the, the more efficient small farmers. It prevents them from, from scaling up. You know? uh, for, for corporations, as uh, <coughs> Dr. Adriana said a while ago, they, they want mostly least. But for medium farmers uh, who wants to scale from, from 5 probably to 15, uh, that is impossible in the Philippines. 
uh, to, to acquire by way of ownership. So, and the, the last uh, is uh, restriction on land conversion, meaning uh, we uh, uh, land reform effectively make agriculture the default in, in the Philippines. Uh, before you move from agriculture to another use, you have to undergo a very deadly process we call land conversion. Ayan. So that's that's the problem. So uh, there are a lot of missed opportunities in this uh, kind of setup because you can scale up in agriculture and you can go to to for example development developing your lands for some other use. Kung ayaw mo na ng agriculture, no. So these are the nuances. So. Uh, as we have said, the fragmentation has prevented realization of economies of scale. So right now, the average fund size is 1.29 hectares, but the the dead deposition is 57 percent of this land has less than one hectare. No, the majority is less than one hectare, and only 0 0.03 percent is more than 50 hectares. So we are actually uh, a land of small farmers uh, as. Uh, yeah, peasants, you know, uh, and uh, most of our farmers are also part-time farmers because of uh, the inability to sustain by farming alone. You know, if you have less than a hectare, it's hard to survive. So, yeah, small is not always uh, uh, beautiful. There has been two studies that were conducted in the last four, four years. You know, one by uh, Adumopoulos in Astusia, who particularly focused on the Philippines uh, land reform program, and he said that uh, agricultural productivity because of carp has been reduced by 17 percent, and uh, the the there's a decrease of average farm, farm size to 34 uh, percent. Dr. Otsuka uh, from uh, IRI also had a study in 2021 saying that in our agriculture will not size up. Uh, the, inefficient, uh, the inefficiency in the agriculture can be uh, a factor in development. Because we cannot sustain, of course, our uh, food security. So, is there uh, a, a, a good prospect you know, on uh, moving forward? You know? The trend is towards easy of this nature. That is the trend, uh, fortunately. In uh, 2019, this is not 2010, no? uh, Republic Act 11231 uh, removed the restrictions on agricultural free patents. This represents around 2.5 billion uh, units, you know, all patents. So, malaki po ito, no? 2.5 million. Uh, when it removed the restrictions, it allows corporations to buy to buy uh, patents. Before, you can, a corporation cannot buy uh, agricultural patent. patents. It's prohibited. Only natural persons can, can buy. Uh, the restrictions of uh, five years was also removed, and uh, the right of the purchase was also removed. Because agricultural free patents, the banks doesn't want to deal with agricultural free patents prior to 2019. Because agricultural free patents, when you sell it, if, if a farmer sells, sells it, the farmer can repurchase it within a period of five years. So nobody wants to buy something that can be bought back by the, by the seller. So this was, this was removed. So uh, uh, agricultural free patent become more accessible to banks, uh, it become bankable. And uh, more recently, just uh, a few months ago, in the Republic of 11953, uh, that condoned uh, the, the debts of farmers with land back, the debt on donation law. So uh, it effectively removes the, the barrier on, on uh, leasing, the legal barrier on leasing, and of course selling the land. Or, although there is a market cap of five hectares, at least there will be more uh, mobility on, on this type of, of land. However, the implementing rules and regulations are, have not yet been released. And we are a bit uh, uh, worried about, about the IRR because uh, uh, of the bureaucratic rules on how the debt will be released. Yun ang nakakatakot. Kasi minsan, uh, releasing the debt will be more difficult than just paying. You know, sabi ka, bayaran mo na lang para mas, mas madali. It, it, uh, uh, there will be a lot of bureaucratic red tapes for the release of the mortgage that will be problematic. 
but we will see. So if you are looking for size, because you are an, an agro-industrial corporation, uh, it was discussed earlier that you know group farming, consultation to leasing, and other agribusiness ventures agreement are uh, open for you. Uh, yung leasing is a bit restricted because wala nga yung mga tenancy whereby the payment will have to be uh, shared by uh, the income, sharing of income, etc. etc. Medyo bawal yan, baka it might be viewed as tenancy. You know? So it is always straight leases. That is why our leasehold agreements are always in the corporate farming. Yung mga dati, mga pre cult corporations, agri corporations, yung bago pa mag cult na dyan. Because they were given 10 years eh. In 1988, the cult, when cult was implemented, these big uh, uh, agricultural corporations were given 10 years, hindi muna sila kinobal eh. Until of course, the, the, the government had made uh, some, some, some decisions and the decisions is the agri-venture agreements. Okay, we will uh, now dispose the lands covered by yung malalaki nating corporations. Uh, meron tayong machine or modality yung agri-business agreements. So, napunta sila doon. Ano? But as said earlier, yung opening a new a new agri-venture agreement with large corporations, yun ang mas mahirap. Ano? Kung if you're already existing at the time of cult, madaling switch lang yan eh, because the tenant, uh, the, the farm workers are there. Ano? You just have to, it's easier to to ano, to, uh, to give them some tenure to lease or something. This is another prospect, but this is in the upland. The indigenous people's titles. Uh, some, some have been exploring this already. But as I had mentioned, we are not very familiar with this title because this title is a bit restricted. restricted. This is not Torres, this is not T simple, this is not, the sale is not absolute. But if you are only looking for the lease, this is a large class of land, but it's in the upland. So there will be some issues, but you will just be talking to a few people. Because in the leasing agreement, you will be talking to, with an average hectare ownership of one, if you want 2,000 uh, hectares, you need to need to talk to 2,000 people with different economic interests. So may hold out dyan, maraming ganun. Because these are 2,000 people to get to. But this, this, uh, ano, IPRA, you will be just be talking to one indigenous uh, people's community. Medyo collective yung ownership nila, but at least you're talking to, to, to one, ano. When they make their decision, it will be a single decision. At if you talk to 2,000 people to lease, the transaction cost is too high, that will be 2,000 decisions that you have to align. So we, we think that this IPRA title is uh, a good way to scale, uh, no, uh, to cooperate uh, farming. The and list on forest lands. Um, this is also another, uh, no, another avenue if you want, if you're looking for size. Uh, DENR has a lot of inalienable, meaning to say this was not disposed to people. This are not covered by God. But these are forest lands. But when we say forest lands in the Philippines, it does not mean that it is forested. No? Hindi naman po uh, The forest land, this is a legal, a legal uh, classification. So forest lands could be agricultural lands actually in the physical state. But uh, the good thing in forest land is that it is inalienable. Meaning to say, you again have to talk only to one guy, the DNR. And uh, probably you, you can you can uh, access that. Because they will not prevent that. You may mga, even, even the DNR is an agro forest program pala. So they have that. So if you're interested in scale, uh, this is another uh, uh, avenue. So. Moving forward, what do we need to do? Of course, the, if you will ask on the side of consolidation to ownership, which is the simplest, this is the simplest uh, modality of, of scaling up, no? Especially for small or medium farmers, we have to remove the, you know, the, the ceiling. You know, because the fear is, we, we call this the zombie apocalypse scenario. If you remove the ceiling, the zombie will come and then eat all the lands. So it, it doesn't happen that way. Eh? Uh, I think it will take several decades to consolidate. Ang mahirap din mag-consolidate eh. but, but if you will remove the ceiling, 
at least the smaller farmers will have the the market has to work before you know large tracts of land happened. Uh, it took down 40 years, almost 40 years, to break it up to small pieces, and it will take probably 70 years to make it as big as the Ukraine farmers. Pagka tining na mo yung mga Ukraines na kakaingit eh, or when the Russians left their tanks. Their, their uh, pump equipment pulled those T-72 tanks and, and hid them in their ponds. Ganun kalalaki yung equipment nila. Ano? Niisip ko nga, yung kalabaw kaya ang kaya ano, pumuha doon. Ano? <laughs> Kung sa Pilipinas nangyari yun, our farmers will not be able to to move that, ano, that, that thing. So, removing the stakeholders, ang uh, maraming suggestions eh. The, the, the most, uh, the bravest wants to remove restrictions uh, entirely, you know, everyone can buy now. Uh, the the moderate says that 25 hectares is, uh, should be the ceiling. Uh, 25 hectares is the, the size of the homestead lots that were given to us during the American times in 1901. They say that this is the the ideal family, family farm, 25 hectares. So if you want to stay in this kind of mode, and in family farms, um, Dr. Fabella is uh, suggesting another scheme, which says that uh, if you are an, an agricultural corporation listed in the in the stock exchange in public, then you have no ceiling. So that is another suggestion of uh, uh, Dr. Fabella. So create a program to consolidate agricultural lands to protect. So it is very difficult to consolidate, especially if you are asking people to come in, the, the, the new ones, to you, you invite them to agriculture. It's very hard because land is very hard to, 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 to get. So uh, there are a lot of suggestions here. We say that if da, if da was the one who fragmented it, then he is also the one should be responsible for integrating it. So he has to do some kind of an integration mechanism to to uh, to allow investors to, to come in without undergoing the very tedious um, uh, transaction process. Uh, we can also promote agroforestry uh, because of course this is the, 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 the sole consideration here is land size. Uh, because we don't want to deal with small, small people, small, small uh, fragmented uh, ownership. You go to the DNR, and maybe you, you maybe your crop is uh, okay for agroforestry. Strengthen the property rights of indigenous people. This is another route. Uh, we have to clarify uh, at least promote the uh, the access of uh, of private investment going to. To, to the indigenous people's community, uh, but of course, ano, accessing their land. Uh, hindi naman masamang ano eh, magkapera, ano, right? indigenous people ka, at least magkakapera kahit yung racial land. Ano, uh, that would probably pave way for the education of your children. Ano? Kasi may ibang tingin naman dyan, uh, that uh, the indigenous people should remain parang indigenous. Ano? Uh, pero siyempre, we, we want them to, to of course, or enjoy the advantage of modern life. So this way, ano, padang maglist tayo sa kanila or something like that. Yung sa yung amend yung repeal yung uh, RA 1218 and PD 194 that restricts that, that, uh, uh, the participation of foreign corporations to uh, rise and call. Sinasabi natin, since this is the most important commodity, mahilig tayo sa kanin, eh, ano, mahilig tayo sa kanin, uh, papasukin natin na yung mga uh, malalaking corporation. Although they are allowed, ano, but uh, uh, there is a 30-year uh, divestment scheme na inilagay pa doon that, that creates some uncertainty to foreign investors. So, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, salamat po sa pagkakulong. Thank you, Attorney Tamson, for going in-depth uh, with the topic of land, which is a very important component of food security. Our next speaker is Attorney Asis Perez, co-convener at Tugon Kabuhayan and the former National Director of the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. So now we're going into fisheries, which is also part of food security. 
Attorney Perez is a distinguished legal professional with a background in veterinary medicine and a Juris Doctor degree from the Ateneo de Manila University. His career has been marked by a strong focus on environmental law and conservation. He served as a lecturer on environmental laws at the UP Law Center, and he held various key roles, including Director of Alternative Environment Dispute Resolution Program at the DENR, and Director of Law Enforcement at Tanggol Kalikasan, an environmental advocacy organization. His expertise led to his involvement with the Special Committee on the Rules of Procedures for Environmental Cases of the Supreme Court. Attorney Perez has received several awards, including the Quezon Medallion ng Karangalan and the Clark R. Bavin Law Enforcement Award for his contributions to environmental protection. He has authored multiple publications on environmental management and law enforcement further demonstrating his dedication to environmental conservation and governance. Let's join me in welcoming Attorney Asis Perez. Maraming salamat, Attorney Karen. Uh, as Karen mentioned, I'm uh, more familiar with uh, fish than probably other agricultural products. And so, ah, okay. Next slide, please. Malaki yung uh, contribution ng fishery sector sa pagkain natin. At uh, this is now becoming stronger because of many factors including consciousness in health, you know, the low carbon emission, things like that. No? See Next slide, please. All right. So, uh, and aquaculture is becoming the backbone of fishery sector. We're no longer very much relying on uh, capture fisheries because of the dwindling fish catch. And of course, uh, aquaculture is more predictable than, you know, hunting, so to speak. Next slide, please. So this is the trend in the Philippines. As you can see, uh, we are producing more fish to aquaculture now than from capture fisheries. Next. All right. And Dahil we are an archipelago, we have a lot of uh, capable individuals to be on this uh, line of uh, uh, maybe uh, work or business. Alam niyo, pag pinagsama-sama natin yung BBM, baka baboy manok, mas marami pa rin yung isda. Okay, nakain na natin. So ito po yung base po ito sa ano, food and nutrition uh, survey. Okay. Next. So what's the benefit of uh, aquaculture? Uh, siguro, isang beneficiary nito can be done in remote areas. And uh, if we do it right, then we prevent migration of workers. We can invest in areas where, uh, and incidentally, in the coastal area, yun yung pinakamalaking populasyon natin. Uh, you will see that uh, on the average, Filipino family, mas marami yung anak ng mga isda. Tabing dagat, no? And so, kung doon tayo mag invest then actually, uh, mas kukunti yung tao nga alis sa lugar. No? And it, dahil malaki tayo, we are, uh, actually bigger than, seven times larger than land, yung, yung, yung ating karagatan at saka yung ating coastal area, mas malaki rin yung potensya natin. And it can provide jobs. Si, sa amin pong karanasan, uh, sa aquaculture, kapag ka meron kang isang cage ng isda, uh, mga tatlong tao po yan ang masusuportahan. 
So for every 25 ton of fish that we produce using our technology now, yung mariculture, uh, tatlong tao po yun. And of course, dahil local yung yung investment mo, may local revenue. And done properly, it can be protective of the environment. Why? Kasi sa isda po, um, yung maliit na cage, 18 meter diameter, can produce 25 tons of protein. Compare that to say pork or um, poultry, uh, you will require a huge track of land by security kasi. Pero yung dagat, malawak kasi yun. And then, uh, the investment is much slower uh, comparing that to other uh, protein sources. Next. So, ngayon, ano yung policy na dapat gawin para mangyari ito? Of course, uh, yung kanina, no? alam nyo ba na pag mag import ka ng uh, feed ingredient, may tarif pa yun. Pero pag mag import ka ng imported feeds, zero tarif yun. I think that has to be... So, what will be the incentive to local feed manufacturers? No? May, may tari pa yung ingredient, pero yung ini-import natin final product, uh, walang tari pa yun. Di ba? So medyo, medyo parang baliktad sa amin. No? Ang isda, zero tarif yan. So yung mga nag import ng isda, nagbabayad, wala silang binabayaran. At ang ginagawa pa nga nila, binsan, kunyari isda, pero karne yung laman. Kasi zero tarif eh. Diba? So malaki yung kalaban namin dito. <laughs> Pangalawa, um, there has to be tenurial improvements. No? In mariculture, we need, we need uh, for every uh, cage that we produce, that we need, where we need to uh, have a fish, kailangan namin ng isang hektaryang lupa doon. No? And we need to improve the tenurial arrangement on uh, fish, uh, what we call uh, uh, fish pan, this area natin. Pagkatapos, meron kaming prohibition uh, from uh, cutting mangroves. No? Way back in, 20, in 1988 or 1989, there was a prohibition of cutting mangrove trees. So if you are to set up aquaculture uh, without cutting the mangrove, it's almost impossible. But at that time, there were only 130,000 hectares of mangrove forest. Now, meron na tayong 217,000 hectares. And so there's now a possibility, some flexibility along that line where, uh, you know, uh, some mangrove areas can be utilized or existing FLAs can, where some fish pond these areas, pwede na natin siguro uh, bawasan ng uh, uh, mangroves. No? Okay. May, may mga makakaaway ako dito, mga environmentalists, but <laughs> I'm one of them. So, this is like almost uh, admission uh, because that, that's where I came from, no? from the environmental movement. But there is also that reality na if you only unlock mga 20,000 hectares of these areas, then there's going to be a lot of uh, production. Right? Of course, we have to, uh, to review the value-added tax provision on the importation of vessels. No? Um, kasi we're using this for producing food, maybe it's 12%. So if you import vessels, um, it's $3 million or $4 million plus 12% uh, BET, that's a lot. No? So if we can maybe rationalize that, I think uh, we can encourage investments, uh, not only in aquaculture but also in fisheries. No? And pangisdaan natin. At kinukuha lang ng iba yung isda natin. No? <laughs> Sige. Um, sa, sa local government, eh, meron national policy na kailangan eh, ayusin. Pero meron din local policies na kailangan ayusin. Number one, kailangan, uh, we, we, and this is based on experience, uh, aquaculture farms must be uh, sown properly. And they're not supposed to, they're supposed to follow biosecurity rules as well. Hindi pwede dikit-dikit. Kaya ang, ang advocacy namin ngayon, 
If you're going to set up an aquaculture farm, dapat wala kang katabi. Dapat exclusive yung area mo. Ikaw na. This will allow you to monitor whether or not, uh, this will allow the local government to monitor if the aquaculture farm operator is following the rules and regulations. No? Yeah. Pangalawa, long-term permit. Alam niyo ba ang permit namin? <laughs> Sa aquaculture, annual. Paano ka maglalagay naman ng investment kung ang iyong permiso ay annual? No? Eh, every three years, di ba, palit yung mayor, eh, pag napag-initan ka ng mayor, di, ano ka na, di ba? So, what we're do, uh, we're, we're successful in some locations where we were able to convince the LGU to give us a 10-year lease, no? Uh, so, that will spark investment kaagad. One year versus 10 years, ang laki kaagad uh, difference na kayo. Of course, yung adherence to safety and labor standards, we also want to take out the fly-by-night operation. You see, if your if you if your standards are relaxed, then you encourage bad investors, and bad investors are the one that that uh, that you know. Ito yung resulta ng fiscal. Eh. Bakit ka nagahara ng fiscal? Kasi na yung mga nagmamadali, di ba? So they don't do biosecurity. Bibili sa nila kasi um, ano eh? Pero kung may mga labor standards kaya malalinaw, then you will be able to encourage only the good investors. And then of course, uh, dapat bigyan ng access yung local community sa produce natin. And this has been a problem in some areas. May mga complaint kasi dyan eh. Oo oh, nga, dito nga yung mga fish pan. Eh, dito naman walang isla. Eh, ano namang incentive ng local communities kung papayag na doon ka maglalagay pero hindi sila makakakain, di ba? I mean, that, that does be part of the policy. Uh, pero, alam nyo, ito kulang to eh. Kasi wala naman magtatanin kung walang bibili. Di ba? So ito, all of this is nothing if there is no incentive on the part of the farmer to plant. And what is the own incentive of the farmer to produce? Siyempre income. Di ba? If you want production, then you have to uh, ensure that whatever the farmer produce will generate uh, uh, profit. <laughs> Otherwise, they will stop. No? So, ano yung dapat kasunod? Higing nga po, ay di, bili natin. Alam niyo, pumunta kayo sa mga shelves. Ano na, ano mapapansin niyo? Ang prominent sa mga shelves natin, important. Di ba? Yun. Kasi wala pa tayong ganyang mindset. So, kailangan ayusin natin yung mindset natin. Pakita ko sa inyo yung ilang slides. Sige nga, next. Okay. Tignan nyo to. Ito yung in-import natin eh. Bigas, corn, onion, garlic, rounds, cod, tuna, beef, chicken. You, you look at it year by year. Tumataas. Hindi ibig sabihin yan. There is continuing displacement of local products eh. Why? Some people will say very inefficient. I'd say the other, the other, uh, and we have evidence that it's not. Kasi ang binibili natin produkto, kalimihan, we are yet to exercise the countervailing measures. Eh. Kasi dumadating dito minsan, imagine some people will tell us, tilapia, pwede lang bilhin ng 50 pesos dadating dito. Anong klaseng tilapia yun? Palagay nyo. Di ba? Tagating dito yon, Bakit? Leg quarters, uh, mo. Paano? Meron bang, meron bang manok na mabuproduce mo? Puro quarters lang. Di ba ang ibig sabihin nun? Yun yung the least of their priority. Kaya dumarating dito lang muna. Yun ang ilalaman sa atin. And many others. Well, you know, etc. Sige po, next. Ito lahat. Marami dito kaya i-produce sa Pilipinas. Next. So, ito example. Kung mag-iisip tayo, local ba o important bibilin mo? Dapat, meron na tayong ganung pag-iisip, di ba? Mamimili na tayo. Kailangan, it's the mind. No? Sige, next. Oh. Ito, bago lang. Ito ha, ito ang data noong May. Tignan mo yung uh, sa bigas, yung imported 37, yung local 34. Ito, Mayo to ha. 
Huwag po yung ngayon kasi medyo artificial yung presyo ngayon. Pero, uh, yung promise halimbawa ng rice tarification, yun ang nangyari, di ba? 34, mas mura pa rin yung local. Eh. Pero dinisplace mo yung farmer kasi yung farmer, ang dami yung dinagtanin. Sige, next. Ayun. Yung galunggong, uh, maraming in-import. Nung nag-import ng galunggong, nalugi lahat yung tilapia. Di ba? Pero hindi nagbago yung presyo ng galunggong, by the way, ha? 180 pa rin. Kahit nung kasagsagan ng importation. Pero nalugi yung tilapia. Kasi na-displace yung tilapia. So, next. At saka, tandaan natin, when we buy our own product, This is not about buying because there's no such thing as people who simply consume. People must work first before they consume anything. Correct? Tapos nung natrabaho muna. So by patronizing our own produce, then we support our workers. By not supporting our producers, then we endanger our jobs. And so I think this is a key message that we might want to take home with us, with us as well. Salamat at maraming, at magandang, at uh, uh, maraming salamat po, at uh, ano, uh, sana uh, nakapag-contribute tayo today. Salamat po. Thank you, Attorney Asis Perez. We are now down to our last speaker, and our last speaker has an extensive experience and he comes from also leading an NGO. Mr. Edisho, Father Ed De La Torre, is the President and Vice Chairperson of the Philippine Rural Reconstruction Movement, or PERRM. Father Ed is also the President and Founder of the Education for Life Foundation, an NGO dedicated to grassroots leadership development. He holds the position of Founding Fellow at the La Liga Policy Institute, Vice President at the Association for World Education, and chairs several boards, including Empowering Civic Participation in Governance, Institute for Popular Democracy, and the Asia Pacific Communication Forum. During former President Estrada's administration, He served as the Director General of the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, or TESDA, where during that time he played a pivotal role in shaping the National Technical Education and Skills Development Plan. His extensive experience also includes leading the development of the community-based training for enterprise development approach, which has had a lasting impact on rural communities and agriculture. Let's all please welcome Father Ed Bellatore. <laughs> Clarification, Bakit Father? Ang sabi nila priest forever, pero ex-priest na po ako. In fact, uh, I did not expect to still be a speaker. Akala ko Q&A na lang kasi sinabi na ni Asis ang point. Because we were brought in, remember our focus is to increase you know, investment, particularly not only public but private investment, so as corporate. And we were asked to address the inclusivity issue, meaning, uh, kung pwede, mas maraming kasali. <laughs> hindi lamang nagbe-benefit, kundi pwede kasali mismo sa, hindi lang production, kundi processing. Because I think uh, one thing we learned uh, over the years is hindi na pwede yung hiwa-hiwalay, value chain yan. No? I, I like to, I don't have a slide. Uh, I have a few, but I thought it's better to just have a few comments that is relevant so that I can engage. I was taking notes and trying to find out how do I make this a conversation? No? Kasi pag NGO, di isip, bibira lang yung bibira. No? I used to say that uh, NGOs, well, technically called non-government organization, marami dyan, lalo na galing sa panahon ng martial law, they should be called AGO, yung anti-government organizations, <laughs> galing sa gobyerno. <laughs> On the other hand, we used to say also that uh, NGOs uh, also don't like to reinforce the other concept of 
anti-government organization, yung anti na anti na lang sa gobyerno, walang gagawin. And I think that's the that's the focus we have. Private sector will do it if it's needed. Problema na lang yung obstacles and incentives. And the same thing also, I think, with uh, NGOs and CSOs. When I, I took over the presidency of PRRM very late, uh, very recently, I was bored for a long time with uh, post martial law in Aboy Morales, Agani Serrano, in Bobby Tanyada. But in 2020, when they asked me to take over, take over as president, so I had to review. Because PRRM, for those who don't know it, uh, is one of the oldest rural development NGOs in the Philippines. 1952 pa yan eh, And rural development in the Philippines, unfortunately, has been as associated not just with poverty, injustice, but also with insurgency and counterinsurgency. Mabuti na lang, less na yung constraint na yun. Kasi one of, one of the main constraints to investment, how can you invest pag magulo? Hindi lamang may magulo rebelde, pati ang gobyerno pagpasok doon, eh mainly ng target. So, wala talagang usapin niya ng investment. Okay, the good news is medyo <laughs> nababawasan na yan. But I think that is one, let's call it this way, uh, parang risk reduction mechanism natin na pag hindi naging inclusive ito, it's just a matter of time before another set of people will come in and exploit the divisions and turn it into an anti-government and it will become anti-elite, anti-corporate. I don't want to, uh, I hope it will not be soon, but I like to in, in, introduce that as one additional motive why we want inclusivity. But the second one which is even more important is a forward looking. There was a time when I think the more logical framework and more rational framework for developing a country like the Philippines from mainly agrarian towards a more advanced industrial a country was yung the usual transformation. No? You increase the production of agriculture mainly through industrial agriculture, no? reduce the workforce, then increase industry, punta ro, and workforce, do na mag earn, and then mata transform. And with globalization, magkakaroon ng ano, parang magandang, the market will take care of yung comparative advantage. Uh, that that framework still seems rational, but the reality is staring us in the face now, no? Nagulo ang mundo, eh. Nagulo ang mundo. So, unfortunately, even the main advocates of a more rational, integrated global market are trying to go into a more, ah, bahala na kami sa aming bansa, bahala kayo. We wish it were not such, but that is the new framework within which we have to operate at least looking forward into the next such a term lang ni BBM. And that is the other argument for inclusivity, not only in terms of social justice, poverty alleviation. I think it's to have a stronger and broader internal base for production, but not, I would like to emphasize, not just primary production. Kasi maraming issue dun. For most of the farmers and fishers and even indigenous people we are working with, hindi pa problema yung productivity as such, yung, hindi ang problema yung sinabi ni Asis na income and sustainable income. Ay, on their own, hindi naman sila business people. Kulang ang capacity nila. Kaya I think the challenge and opportunity, with, that's why I, I welcome being invited here, is paano ngayon, NGOs like us, working with local communities of small producers, that's the reality in the Philippines, and the reform has happened, and also capacity of people who don't have that much education or technical skills or capital, talagang maliliit. I think our role should be how to help, you know, aggregate in different forms, and how to link them with willing business uh, enterprises not only in terms of improving primary production, but even more important, processing and marketing. Give you a quick example, at least some positive. Uh, Jollibee is well known already, but 
I, I met, I don't know whether you, you know the, the, the brand, uh, basta ito yung organic, no? Typically, may mga ibang pumapasok sa agricultural organic galing sa IT na stress na stress. Tapos sabi nila, sige mag-agri na lang ako. And I met some people, sabi nila, when we went into it, hindi naman pa nila kaya ang production. Magaling sila sa marketing at processing. So, what happened is, naghahanap na lang sila ng kapartners na primary producers. Ayusin ang agreement to have uh, parang post-harvest logistical capacity. Tapos sila na mag-aayos ng processing and marketing. Because sabi nga niya, kahit organic, kung primary lang, edi one day lang yan, no? Pero nandidevelop siya hanggang parang fast food na organic, something like that. That kind of thinking, I think, offers new opportunities, no? It addresses the fact that there is a new and growing market that it prefers wholesome, healthy, environmental food. But at the same time, their principal expertise is financing, marketing, processing, logistics, not primary. No? Because, well, there are still possible scales of more efficient primary production. Tanggapin natin ang reality. If majority are smallholders, majority hindi pa ganun ka-efficient, but there can be efficiency, and I think the papel, either in partnership with government, local government, or corporations, na tumutulog na kami mag-aggregate. No? And yun ang usapan namin. The second one, in relation to IP, interesting ito, ha? it starts again with advocates for the indigenous people, we work mainly in some violence with the ITAS, yeah, 22,000 ang ano doon, kanti. Ang tanong ngayon ay, siyempre, very, very fertile yun because of uh, pinatubo. Ang lalaki ng kalabasa ay wala. Pero, unang-una, wala namang bibili ng ganun kalaking kalabasa. At pagbaba na, mura-mura. Now, suddenly, a group of parang hotels and restaurants, the principal owner said, oh, sige, tulungan namin. Paano? And so, sabi nila, uh, maghahanap kami ng markets, pwede bang mag-agree yung ano, mga ITAS dyan na magpa-plant sila ng either, modify natin yung ube ba or kasaba and all that. That's where I think the, the role of NGOs and uh, LDUs can come in to bridge, no? The, naghahanap talaga, corporations want scale. <laughs> no? And ayaw nila lang sila magagawa ng pagbubuo at pag-organize I think that kind of role will, will be one that we can fill, no? But of course, NGOs like us also have to overcome our tradition, uh, mainly hanggang equity lang kami, hanggang ownership, hanggang broad policy. But we should go to the actual nitty-gritty of dealing with people, working with them, and saying, okay lang makipag-partner tayo, not just with government, but with corporations. The very term non-government, meaning ang traditional focus ng NGO, gobyerno. It, it, it still bago sa Pilipinas yung idea na NGOs and civil society organizations can work together with business communities who want also in the in the language of this inclusive business. So it's in a way peripheral at this point to the main topic because we are talking of how to increase private, especially private sector investment. And with the constraints I hear about problema ng scale at problema ng leaks. I think that's where possibly, I will not call it a new generation, but that part of the NGO community that is willing to enter into this, you know, can collaborate with you. And just as final, I just want to reinforce uh, Asi's point. It is not an issue of uh, immediate tactical comparative advantage. I think we also have to agree, as a country, and a community and a government. Ano bang habol natin, no? Uh, should we, should we try as much as possible to be self-sufficient? But in a, in an uncertain world, uh, dapat we have a more flexible policy, depende sa situation. Uh, but between the two, we would rather not reduce our existing productive capacity preferably expand it. At the same time, bukas tayo where it makes sense to complement, not just uh, tactically, but strategically. Saan ba talaga tayo? Mas ang strategy ay patungo sa complementation of uh, trade no? and importation versus local production. 
PRRM, as PRRM, we have always been traditionally also been land-centric, you know? Kaya it was Asis Perez, uh, whom I want to acknowledge. Siya yung nangumbisi sa amin na, Uy, Ed, mana tayo, no? We are a maritime and archipelagic nation, and our 2.2 exclusive economic zone and the blue economy has more possibilities compared to uh, the land-based. But still, we are land animals, and uh, many of our, even our fishers folk have to come home to land after they fish. So I think, uh, while he has uh, let's say effectively convinced me and us hopefully about the importance of fisheries and marine, we have to address the issue of local production, buying local, and balancing, managing, I would say, calibrating rather than a, a kind of a sweeping importation policy on various, especially finished products. I, I share with you, bakit ka lang hindi lagyan ng tarif versus yung mga components which will then reinforce uh, local businesses to invest in the whole value chain. So those are just the two items I want to mention. Uh, we are trying as PRRM to bring together different uh, non-government organizations to enter into this kind of relationship. And I would just like those of you in government here to revisit the 2021 study of the United Nations DESA, the Division on Economic and Social Affairs, which says we must reconsider rural development if we want to achieve the sustainable development goals. We cannot see economic growth as primarily urban industrial and the rural as residual. And we should not see the rural simply as poverty reduction or uh, uh, lessening inequalities. We should see the rural and agro-industrial as another engine of growth for national development. I hope that I have contributed my little share to this important dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ed De La Torre. It seems very appropriate that he was our last speaker. He's able to really integrate all the issues that were discussed earlier. So now we'll now proceed to our open forum where we'll have an opportunity to ask questions from our speakers. And we ask everyone, uh, the audience here, you can ask questions by simply approaching the microphones that we have here. And when you ask a question, please state your name and the company or association where you're from. So we'll be opening the floor for questions and we will now be having our open forum. So we, may we invite our speakers to please be here on stage. Discussion. <laughs> but uh, 
earlier, let's let's go to a point raised by the Department of Agriculture. So, uh, Assistant Secretary Engineer um, Arnel de Mesa mentioned clustering and consolidation, and that seems to be an approach that is supposed to address efficiency, economies of scale. Uh, but earlier, we had a very good discussion from attorney Tiamson, who really went in depth with the uh, CARP law. So the question first, let's go to that strategy of consolidation when it comes to land agriculture. Uh, attorney, do you think that it's sufficient when you mentioned um, amending Republic Act 6657 and laws like Republic Act 3018 or PD 194? Or do you think there's a necessity to completely overhaul the CARP law in order to really achieve uh, this strategy of consolidation? Ang sabi ko nga, matagal yan eh. It took 40 years for that to fragment it eh. So, uh, the, the first step maybe is to allow uh, allow the market to function. Because the market will function when, when it needs consolidation, it will consolidate. Uh, if if uh, it will be inefficient to consolidate, then it will not. But it will take a lot of years. Uh, so, uh, it will take a lot of years. Uh, dito naman sa CAL, uh, the last remaining, ano naman, uh, uh, hold out sa CALP law, telephone law, is the restrictions on that ownership. Yun lang, but I believe, I think, ano, because the the worry in removing the cap is that if you remove the cap, all will sell. And, and this has been, we've been battling this for a long time, since we, in, in 2009, when we want uh, the residential free party to, to remove the restriction, the, the people say that if you will not put restriction, once you give title to a, to a person, to a beneficiary, that person will sell. But, but, but they did not sell. Uh, the, our data from LRA, usual consumption, like 7% uh, in the last uh, 10 years. So these are just normal market market functions. So the, the, the fear that there will be a massive mega consolidation, uh, these are just fears. So the, the, the first step, of course, is to to uh, to remove the cap, you know, remove the cap, and the second is, uh, uh, of course, allow uh, conversion so that we will not miss economic opportunities, because a lot of economic opportunities were lost because uh, uh, we, we tie that the land as agricultural land, and therefore we cannot use it for some other purpose. So, many projects ang natigil because of that. Thank you. Let's go to Attorney Ansis Perez. You talked about importation and uh, you compared some of the commodities you have but with uh, specifically with with fish, for example. Uh, you talked about displacement. So what do you think are necessary policies when it comes to one supporting our fishery sector, but then balance, balancing that with um, policies on importation, and then encouraging the growth of the fishery sector? Well, siguro, uh, yung fishery sector, siya yung sector na hindi humihingi ng subsidy, siya rin yung hindi humihingi ng support. We never, most of the most of the sectors, like uh, yung rice, alimbawa, binibigyan ng input sa libre, yung fishery sa uh, nagbibigay, pero hindi kailangan. It's not necessary. Why? Because the serious companies in aquaculture are able to do it without any subsidy. All you need often is the tenure, tenure security. And we've seen that, you know, for instance, uh, in in uh, Pantabangan, we tried to get into Pantabangan because it can produce for us at least for 20,000 metric tons. It took us uh, seven years uh, to apply for a permit and we're yet to get it. No, so, so medyo ano siya, and, and so we, we, we think that uh, kayang-kaya ng aquaculture sector na mag-grow. And ang problema lang, kung medyo maraming restrictions, hindi kami mag-grow, at kung, like, in one, one case, ito nangyari actual. No? Uh, there was a time when there was a massive importation of galunggong, 100,000 metric tons. No? 
Nung nag-import ng mga metal sa metric tons of gulong gulong, ano epekto nun? Lahat ng farm namin sa Nueva Ecija na lugi. Kasi nag-40 pesos ang tilapia. 40-50 pesos. Pag nalugi na sila one time, ang hirap bumalik. Ang hirap bumalik. So there has to be calibrated. I'm not saying no importation at all. No? What I'm saying is it has to be calibrated. Uh, and there has to be shown na may, meron talagang necessity. Uh, because sometimes we rely on... Uh, I would lack, uh, I'm sorry to say this, uh, unreliable data. Yung tinasabi natin na not real-time information na nagiging basis ng decision. Meron kami tinatawag sa, sa isda na operational level data. Uh, the operational level data allows you to make decisions in real time. No? But most of our policy makers, they use uh, PSA data which is not operational level. And so when you do that, magkakamali talaga tayo sa desisyon. At yun, pag nagkaroon ng, ng ganong sitwasyon, magkakaroon ng lugihan yan. So, yun. And pag nalugi yung farmer, minsan hindi na hakabawi. Yung malalaki mahakabawi yan, pero yung maliliit. Remember that most of our, our holders are small. So when they lose money, very difficult to, to come back. Yeah. Yes, of course, I think Dr. Adriano has something to add. Yeah. Uh, first, I think the major policy uh, reform that should be done is, if, uh, is in terms of really examining yung, yung sinasabi nga ni Atorne na yung uh, 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 giving coastal access. Kasi we have not seen any uh, uh, new op, uh, permits for coastal access for several decades now. And, prob and, prob and this is one of the major reasons our salt industry declined because there has been no postal access permits being issued by the responsible government, national government agency I that mentioned. And at the same time, you have to go through the LGUs, you know, problem. So that has to be examined. Ano ba dapat yung, yung policy job for opening to make it easily accessible, the viable, sustainable areas? I think that's the first major policy reform that we need to do, to develop the aquaculture and mariculture. The second policy issue that needs to be addressed is these tariffs on fish, uh, imported fish. I think we need to study carefully uh, whether we should impose tariffs on fish because as the authority said, whether it's competing with our local produce. But I do believe that we have a comparative advantage in uh, milk fish, and uh, tilapia production. That has to be protected uh, within a certain period, 10 years or something like that. It cannot be forever protected like what we're having the 50 years now, they still want protection. It's time bound, protect it, but the thing is that we need to uh, examine yung tariff muna, impose natin tariff. And third, once we allow the entry of imported fish, I think we should uh, auction it. Kasi ang an existing system is just allocated to the current players, which about 22. You know, you problem. So, they, so that's the reason why you cannot bring down the prices of balloon gold, because it is given to favored importers rather than being auctioned. For example, I will cite an example. Balloon gold is about 55 pesos when you import that during our time. Landed cost 80 to 85 pesos. But we were complaining, why is it 240, 260 in the market? Yeah. So there's a problem there. So you have to look at it in a more general uh, perspective rather than just saying, hey, this one, this one, this one. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, Dr. Adriano, you have something to add? Earlier you showed us the stats for grains, and it seems like the tariff rationalization is a problem that cuts across borders apart from the commodities, also with the grains, it's a, an experience. What, what do you think would be uh, an important policy that should be considered in order to really rationalize our, our loss on tariffs, but also to bring down the price of inputs particularly for feeds, which is a very important component when we're talking about food security. Okay, as you know, uh, we've shared to you the, the total uh, demand for the feed mill industry. And with that demand, there are a lot of opportunities 
communities beyond the local industries where they can supply, right? But at the end of the day, what is uh, challenging here is on, on the feed milling side, first is the lack of real-time data, okay? You have the lack of real-time data, the second is And the thing is that what Arnel was saying is that we need continuity in leadership of the department because long gestating yung maraming crops eh. For example, pagtatanim ka ng mango eh five years bago magbunga o eh you're, you're changing your being a secretary every two years. So there is no continuity. How can you sustain it? Unlike in Vietnam and Malay Malaysia particularly, they have a five-year program. This is our plan and this is the budget that you're going to allow. Wala papalit dyan. Vietnam does it that way. So, there is continuity of program because it will take some time before the agriculture sector really develop because it's a relatively medium gestating development process. Hindi yung factory na pagkaginawa o gawa na agad. Hindi ganun po yun eh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? I think I saw our... Yes, ma'am.
Yes, yes. this microphone. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I, I think we don't, most of our government types are not yeah, here anymore. Sorry, so there, but <laughs> I suppose the ADR sub base will be responsible for transmitting our <coughs> our ideas and the things that are shared here. Um, so your name and my, I'm sorry, Sally okay. Bulatao. Uh, I was invited by Tugon. <laughs> Welcome. And uh, yeah, just two uh, two points, no. One is, um, we've been talking about tariffs, on imports, etc. And also um, other taxes. You know? But the whole agro-industry sector relies on fuel. You see, uh, there's excise tax there. And excise tax has been limitless, even if the price of, uh, of crude has gone up, we have not touched the excise tax. So I think either the DA or the sector itself has to, uh, has to tell our economic managers that look, don't, don't uh, uh, do something that is bad for the producers themselves. There's excise tax which is being used by everybody. Why don't you put a cap, not remove the entire excise tax on the volume, but you see it's already way, way above the no nag-umpisa tayo mag excise tax on the volume. What was the price of uh, of crude, of imported crude, no? Yung ganon, no? So just things like those will, will already be good for everybody. That's one. And then just the other point is, um, I'd like to acknowledge what Dr. Fermin said, that uh, there's no continuity, no? Which is very correct, <laughs> no? And I, I just think that, again, it's something to relate to the DA is that um, yes, we have had programs that have worked, and it's not as if every every secretary doesn't know what he's doing. Okay, the thing is, I think that even our institutes, let's say, feel rice. No? Just a few days ago, I saw the I saw the roadmap, the rice roadmap. You uh, said you must be, you must remember that. No, they want another roadmap. You see, instead of instead of looking at it, I was happy with that roadmap uh, with field rice about, I know, because they took off from from the study on uh, benchmarking the cost of production, which is very good, I think. Yeah. So, so that's you're, my you're, second point. Oh yes. Yeah. Any question then for our panel? Well, the first point was why not the uh, uh, yes, 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 yes. and the second point is on continuity. Why not tell the A two? Uh, stop doing roadmaps and improve on existing roadmaps. So those uh, are the two questions. Uh, uh, the first one, uh, Sally, the first one is that there is a pill rice uh, food, and rice industry roadmap. There was another one that I mentioned during my turn. It's, it's a thick volume, two volumes, filled and rice industry roadmap uh, funded by ABD. And there's a third ongoing roadmap that is being done under Yusef and uh, Yusef uh, I can discuss to you probably uh, privately what are the differences. Yun lang po, tatlo po yan. Doon sa excise tax, um, ang, actually it's the EBAT that you mentioned, 12%. Uh, and uh, as far as agriculture as, uh, uh, crops are concerned or commodities are concerned, we don't impose VAT if it's not processed. So, kung, kung raw, hindi, hindi. Sa, sa, sa agriculture, ang tayo gano'n. Doon naman sa petrol product, Ganito po yung sitwasyon dyan eh. Uh, the study of the DOA found out that the majority of the users of petrol are the rich people. 60% or more than 60% of uh, uh, petrol users in the country are you like you and me, you, you have cars to buy. So if you lower the, the, the VAT, that means you will actually benefit the relatively well of 40% lang kasi yun so the better solution they're saying is that unfortunately it's not being done efficiently is to do give subsidy to the drivers. You know, sa, 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 kasi instead of uh, lifting generally, wherein ang magiging beneficiary, katulad lang namin nila kare na isa sa kyan. <laughs> eh bakit hindi lang lang na itax natin yung mayayaman and then subsidize natin yung mayayira. Unfortunately, yung pag... pag Yung execution of problem natin sa like any about you. 
Yung po problema. Yung lang po ang nalaman. Actually, even we more problem. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, one more question. Ah, we have a question from our audience. I have a question for uh, Dr. Adriana. Yes, sir. Uh, right now, chicken leg quarters are landing at 90.4. Map. Outside map, it's landing at 96, meaning with SSG. According to the DA Bantai pressure, the prevailing price now, retail. 190. That is right now, farm day is at 85, lowest, San Miguel and Yong Hak. That is 100%. And yet, there are a lot of uh, economists who claim we are protected. Are we protected? Do consumers benefit? Sir, your name again and I am attorney in shop now of UBRA, United Broiler Racers Association. Because we will not move forward as long as the obsession is in tariffs. We have not implemented the design of the WTO which include domestic support, trade remedies, and quarantine. We do not even have a trade, a data system. We, did not in, we have yet to implement the 1997 provision of ACMA on having a national information network. And yet, every year, including the Foundation for Economic Freedom, would file proposals with the Tariff Commission, which is under the DOF, under our economic managers, alleging protection, that we are protected how can you do that to us? Anyway, can I, can I respond now, sir? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, first, the tariff commission is not under DOF. It's under NETA, officially. Yung po. CTRN. OTR, tariff and related matters. That's, it's, an, it's, it's an agency under the supervision of the National Economic and Development Authority. It's not, it's not DOF. Secondly, uh, ang, ang problem kasi dyan, yung benchmarking na ginawa, hindi ko ginawa ito, ginawa nila Dr. Goliti, who's a friend of yours, unfortunately, is very sick, ano? I am very used to him. Very sick, yeah, this He looked at, he, he did a benchmarking of the the prices of chicken and pork in Thailand, I think with Gio Gonzalez, and he found out that our prices here are exorbitantly high. In fact, 73% higher than Vietnam, probably double than in Thailand. And uh, I think the main reason for that is because the cost of raw materials here are quite expensive. Okay? Kasi they produce corn in Thailand, uh, Vietnam imports corn, but at 2%. So, in other words, when we are saying is that we should liberalize, we are not just saying liberalize on the chicken for pork side. You have to look at the liberalization from the entire value chain. <clears throat> Kaya lang, ang problema natin is that it is a political game. It's a political process. As one told me, we were well, the ones who introduced the low livestock uh, industry development program. And even in that, the core was dropped. Because as they said, you know, chicken and hogs do not vote, but corn farmers do. So yun yung po yung situation. So wala pong pala yan, walang personal lang po yan. Uh, it, it's just that the study from our perspective, uh, based on our specialization, the economics of it, is that it shows that we have exorbitantly high price for chicken. And it's not because of you, it's probably because of the imperfection in the supply chain, the marketing. Diba? Kasi talaga makikita mo, there are layers and layers of traders here compared to Thailand, mga tatlo o apat lang dito. It can go as high as 5 or 7. So, wala pong ano problem. Ang inano namin is liberalization across the board, not just chicken, not pork. But the thing is that if we need protection, that's what we're saying, we make it time-bound. Do not make it eternal. Kasi kawawa naman, if you look at the, towards the downstream, 
yung consumer, sinasabi nga ni, ni Asi Kurt Arnel, as you grow older in that country, your protein deficiency increases. So if you're 30 to 17 years old, your protein deficiency is about 47%. And why? Why? Because simple, the prices are too high, it's beyond their means. So the solution there is, kasabi natin, increase their income. Okay, how do we do that? Or you lower the prices by lowering tariffs so that imported items will come in, raw materials, and then in product will lower. So ganun po yung pagtig namin. Wala pong personal yun. It is just, you know, it's just economic logic behind all of these things. Uh, we're not engaged ako. I've never been engaged in agriculture na malaki yan. I just plant a little bit in my small plot. I'm not engaged in fisheries. I'm not even, you know, marami akong aso kasi yung protection ko. But, bakit hindi ako kasama ko din, chicken, hindi po ako kasama dyan. Sure. Kaya wala po akong interest na pinaglalaban o hindi po ako consultant na sinabi ninyo ng ano, uh, fisheries and aquatic world. Uh, hindi po totoo yung sinasabi nyo nyo. Ah, sir. I base that on a billionaire.com article. You can sue me anytime, but I base that on a billionaire.com article. You can deny the... If you want to sue anyone, you, you sue that fellow. Who's, who's the billionaire article? Uh, right .com. You, you Google it. Okay. That was my basis. It was nothing personal. I, I have... We have no, we have yet to have any confrontation since you joined the DA. Ang kalaban ko lang naman yung sekretaryo mo eh. Kalaban? Diretso ka niya. Ako po. Yung meron other reasons not manifested out one. Ako po professional analyst. Yun ako po. Pero sir, you know, we need, as Filipinos, we need to come together. If we want to move forward. But, if we, if, those in combat, like ASIS and I, we are in production. Yes. We are constantly bombarded with proposals to bring down tariffs without any counterpart domestic support. Domestic support is a WTO term. Ta so, yeah. so, why is it that the Foundation for Economic Freedom and other economies would insist on bringing down tariffs without even discussing with us? Are we really protected? The Management Association of the Philippines and Secretary Habito filed a petition to bring down all tariffs oh. supposedly to benefit consumers. The problem is, right now, chicken, chicken, as I said, they're landing at 90.4. Farm rate is at 85. Retail is at 190. Then you tell us tariffs are high, we are protected. Uh, yeah. ko it's not realistic, sir. Yeah. Palagay ko mga technical smuggling na dyan, eh. Oh, oh. That, that's for another smuggling. forum. Dapat nga may separate forum tayo for so, technical but, smuggling. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sorry but, uh, but this is now my only opportunity to talk yeah. to Dr. Anna. <laughs> <laughs> because I try to avoid that. Uh, Mara kayo ko masasabi mo, sir, na nakita tayo dito, hindi man lang kita mag-uusap. Eh. So, <laughs> anyway, mas, ma marami po, marami na tayo yeah. oras na mag-uusap kasi may tayo dito. We have five minutes left for okay. the closing Bang, remarks. So, I, I think, uh, the floor to yeah. you. Thank you. And I think this is a good, oh, we have, we have one person raising his hand, but uh, unfortunately, we have to wrap up. So, I think this is a good opportunity for our panelists to talk to the audience and this is why we have an open forum or town hall discussion. It's really to bring all the stakeholders together. And as we can see, it has become a platform for everyone to come together and really address this food security issue. So thank you so much to our panelists and esteemed speakers. It was really a productive morning of discussion. And now to give our closing remarks is Mr. Rupert Paul Manhit. He's the Chief Operating Officer and Managing Director of Strat Base Group. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. R.P. Manhit, to give the closing remarks. You know It's a discussion. It's a good one.
on behalf of Stratbase, Stratbase Group, uh, we would like to thank everyone for coming over. And I just wanted to share some of my thoughts uh, for today's uh, forum. Over the past year, we Filipinos have faced challenges on food security, especially amid an emerging cost of living crisis. Although the Philippine government has been busy addressing hunger issues, national leaders acknowledge that significant obstacles remain. The vulnerabilities in our food production and delivery systems emphasize the urgency of addressing food security. Issues like hunger will persist unless we collectively take concrete action to transform our approach to food production, distribution, and accessibility. To meet the increasing demand for food, the, the government must prioritize food security as a national agenda. Addressing these challenges necessitates the transformation of the country's agriculture sector with a focus on promoting, promoting innovative investments in manufacturing, especially in the agro-industry -agri space. Leveraging on the Philippines' abundant natural resources, skilled workforce, and growing population, agro-industrial manufacturing has the potential to drive value across food production and ultimately spur consumption and the economy. Large-scale corporate farming and other agriculture investments should also be encouraged to increase production and improve the quality of agricultural commodities used as mater raw materials for animal and human food manufacturing, which in turn will strengthen the country's overall agricultural supply chain. These investments will effectively bridge the production gap in the agriculture sector. As these investments come, we need at the onset a stable source of raw materials before we reach stability in our food supply chain. If we need to lower the tariffs of these raw materials, let us do so in the meantime until our production catches up. Other vital initiatives to encourage more agro-industrial investments include creating a conducive regulatory environment for business and providing incentives and more support for agriculture research and development. Building infrastructure projects through PPPs to modernize transportation and logistics systems for the efficient distribution of food is also needed. Moreover, there is a need to streamline and harmonize transport regulations across cities to address logical, logistical costs. Given the pivotal role of innovation in these endeavors, we call upon the government to take immediate and collective action to build a more food-secure Philippines. By the private sector, government, and the academe working together in crafting policies and other initiatives to promote investment in the agro-industrial manufacturing sector we will not only safeguard the health and well-being of our citizens, but also strengthen the foundation of our, of our nation's future. Thank you and good morning to all. Thank you again, Mr. R.P. Manhit, for your closing remarks. And thank you very much, everyone who joined us today, both to our speakers and distinguished guests in the venue in person, but also for those who joined us online. Again, I'm Attorney Karen Jimeno, and it has been a pleasure being with you here today. Have a great day, everyone. And of course, because this is a food security forum, we have food for you. So feel free to please grab food in the back. Thank you again. And in the meantime, may we ask our speakers to please be on stage for a photo with our uh, speaker also for the closing remarks.